Hey, Michael here. Welcome to another episode of Acquisition Synonymous. Today, me, Bill, and Mills uh, went into uh, a printing company that prints CD sleeves, or used to, uh, located in the Northeast, doing $5 million a year in revenue. Uh, and it was really interesting. And I also told some stories about owning a DeLorean. So hopefully you enjoy the episode. Uh, really a fun one for us to think about this type of business, who should buy it, how you should structure it, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, here is the episode. Hope you enjoy it. Hey, Michael here. Want to talk to you about today's sponsor for the episode, uh, which is cloudbookkeeping.com. Uh, so cloud bookkeeping is actually run by my neighbor, Charlie. So I've met him in person and uh, can attest that he's a real human being and a good person. Uh, and what cloud bookkeeping does is offer a full suite of bookkeeping services uh, all in the cloud uh, for you around QuickBooks and other technologies that you're using as a small business owner. Uh, so if you're interested in getting the bookkeeping part of running a business off of your plate and focusing on running your business, uh, Charlie and his team are one to call. Um, they can put together a bunch of other stuff in terms of helping you manage and grow your business besides just bookkeeping, um, sophisticated reporting, uh, definitely helping you get your QuickBooks online set up in the right way, uh, and a number of things around payroll as well. So. Uh, definitely know them and recommend them. If you want to find out more about cloud bookkeeping, um, you can go to their website at cloudbookkeeping.com. Uh, reach out to Charlie. I know many of you have uh, and see if he can help you uh, make your running your business easier and more fun by uh, letting them help with a lot of the bookkeeping solutions. So, uh, And when you call, mention this podcast. Uh, it would help us uh, and help Charlie know uh, that we're supporting him as well. So Thanks a bunch, and cloudbookkeeping.com uh, as the sponsor for today's episode. All right, guys, we got the gang all here. We're wearing the same clothes as last episode. Do you think anybody will notice? Uh, if you keep bringing it up, everyone's going to notice. <laughs> Only every time be, you bring be it cool, up. Be cool, man. <laughs> be cool, man. <laughs> oh, wait, I can, I can make it different. I'll change the color behind me. Yeah, nobody will I'm notice. I'm loving this about you, Gurley. <laughs> I love your mood lighting. It's fantastic. Uh, all right. Well, we got us a deal here for Friday. Uh, anybody want to read it or you want me to read it? I'll read it. This is a cool one. So it's a it's highly profitable. They're always highly profitable on this show. <laughs> a highly profitable specialty packaging company. Founded in 1985, the company is a leading United States specialty packaging company focused on packaging envelope products and located in upstate New York. Their goal is to create high-quality products for customers using the best materials, print, and manufacturing methods, and providing cost-effective and environmentally friendly options, blah, blah, blah. They were, they were a leading manufacturer of sleeves and envelopes for various computer data storage products such as CDs for decades and have since transitioned to producing sleeves and envelopes for other markets. These other markets include protecting RFID chip-enabled identification cards, bank cards, and passport cards, uh, packaging for hotel key cards, gift cards, retail receipts, medical instructions, and archiving films and photos are also significant products. The company serves the hospitality, medical, financial services, retail, and entertainment industries, and they are a GSA contract holder selling to the United States government. Probably want to come back to that. Hmm. The company employs a 92% enjoys a 92% rate of repeat business through its exceptional product quality, timelessness, timeliness, service, and attention to detail. This drives word of mouth and long tenured relationships. And their customer mix is about 46% hospitality and retail, about 21% government and financial services. These are really not helpful combinations. Government, which requires the GSA <laughs> contract, and then financial services in, one, in the same part of the pie, really not helpful. 14% um, medical testing and healthcare, uh, and the rest, they have got about 20% legacy optical disc manufacturers and other. Um, and they're pretty well diversified between Tyvek and RFID blocking sleeves at 29%, paper card sleeves at 22%, paper envelope packaging at 18% or 19%, paper board sleeve packaging at 19%. Uh, their financial performance looks pretty good um, semi-recently. So they had uh, about three and a half million in sales in 2019, another about three and a half million in 2020. And four and a half million in 2021. And they're projecting 5.1 million in 2022 and 5.5 million in 2023. Not insane projections, about 10% annual topside growth. Their EBITDA was 160,000 in 2019, 270,000 in 2020, 860,000 in 2021. They project 1 million in 2022 and 1.1 million in 2023. 
got to hand it to the broker in this case, not hockey sticking the projections. Um, so it says the company has generated cons- considerable earnings growth. And they hold two US trademarks and have applied for a third trademark. And it's one of the only three companies in its industry who is authorized to purchase Tyvek directly from DuPont for the envelope market segment. Potentially interesting. Mm. Um, and it says they've got diversified industries. They've got a team of 25 people. 20 of them are in manufacturing. Two of them are in office and accounting, and three of them are in sales. Uh, they got 160 active accounts. 92% of their business is repeat, as I mentioned. Um, and their customer concentration, they've got one customer A who's 10%. Customer B is 10%. Customer C is 7%. Customer D is 6%. It falls off from there. So what do you guys think? So this has to be small run stuff, right? It doesn't like, like I look at just the way their teams build, right? It's 20 people who are doing manufacturing, two in office, three in sales. They're only doing 5 million a year in sales as a manufacturer. And then they describe all these different things they're doing. And I look at them and most of these are just like, we're going to do 10 or 20,000 of these things, right? It's nothing that's really big enough that you would go take it and say, oh, I need 4 million of these things. I'm going to go produce them in a lower wage cost market, like rhymes with China. Um, so anyway, do, is that what the way you guys are kind of guessing this business works? Their, their niche is actually, they do these small run things so they don't have to worry about it kind of getting, getting offshored. Either that or it's just in time. Ah. Either that or it's like it has to, they need it quick. And so it's not necessarily small batch, but it has to be domestic because people need it like in a week. Well, I mean, the the US government piece of the business has to be domestic, I'm sure, with that GSA. I would be really, really curious to see like the 10 year revenue, 15, 20 year revenue, because if these people made CD sleeves and they've pivoted to this, like that is so impressive. I mean, Truly, like mad respect and props to this company for navigating. Like if you were the people who made CD sleeves, I'm thinking of like the paper CD sleeves that had like the film in the front, you know, where you could see what was inside, Mm -hmm. like the cheap, just paper ones. If you were the like 800 pound gorilla in that business and you migrated to anything, that's just super impressive. Because I mean, how there were millions, probably billions of those made uh on an annual basis and now i mean it's got to be you know a tenth maybe have you guys looked at this this kind of business formation pattern where you you watch a technology that's migrating away very quickly so it's like let's say cds or floppy disks is a great example and you just basically let everybody else leave the market because they think it's going to die and you just stay there and dominate it so like a great example is there's this guy who um, he's he's one of the two or three in the US and he basically is the person who deals in like floppy disk drives. Like and so if you're like trying to get a floppy disk drive for like some old ass computer, like you call him up and he sells you one that's used and that he recovered, right? And so he's kind of like our I guess Bill you and I did that the telecom recovery thing mm-hmm. where they're taking phone systems from these corporations and then reselling them. The guy just does that, but he just said, well, okay, if you guys don't want to do floppy disks anymore, that's fine. I'll just stay here and become the world leader in floppy disks. And like, it's a cool thing. And then also, did you guys ever hear about what happened with the DeLorean Corporation? You know, the DeLorean cars? Yeah, the cars. Yeah. So coolest thing about DeLorean, right? So DeLorean was this car brand. By the way, I owned a DeLorean, so I read up on this. But like, if you wanted to get parts for DeLorean, there's actually a guy who did this. Like he went and when DeLorean went bankrupt, he said, you know what? I bet all these people that own DeLoreans are going to want to get DeLorean parts. So he was in Houston and he went to the bankruptcy court and he bought like all their old parts. And like, so he's been sitting there like selling, like if you want to get a custom, you want to get an original door handle for a DeLorean, you got to call him and he sells you whatever he wants to charge. Um, so it's just this interesting thing where you can find this cool niche to build a business around when the rest of the world just moves on and says this thing's dead. And you say, no, no, it's not dead. I'm going to make a living on it. Super fun. I, I love how Michael just admitted that he is Marty McFly and that is he's from the future and that's how he knows so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, was yeah, waiting, so I was waiting for the back to the future, <laughs> Marty McFly. <laughs> it's, it, dude, owning a DeLorean, there's two things that surprise me about owning a DeLorean. One I should have known, the other one that was a huge surprise. Number one, Number one is they are some unreliable cars. Like it was, it would break all the time. (laughs) And like when I bought the car, I like, I got it from a guy and I, my buddy actually went up there to do the inspection. And when the car showed up, the door panels were off 
And the car came with a two foot long screwdriver. And I was like, why did the car come with a two foot long? It was clearly had been added. And so the first day, it's like 100 degrees in San Antonio. And I'm like, I'm going to go get some coffee in my DeLorean. So I drove down to the coffee shop in the DeLorean, park in the parking lot. It's 100 degrees outside, sun shining on me. By the way, these things were built in Northern Ireland. So the air conditioning is was shite. Like it didn't work. And so like I'm in there cooking in this car and I'm like trapped. Like I can't get out. Only then did I figure out what the screwdriver was for. The screwdriver was included to help you get out of the car so you weren't trapped in it and baked to death like a muffin. So that was- How did you use it? Did you shatter the window? I mean, did you like lever out the door? Oh, no. So you would take the two foot long screwdriver and you like, there was a part where you put it in and you would use it to twist the door assembly. Because remember, it had gold wing doors, right? So you twist the door assembly and that's how you got out of the car. So that was issue number one, like super unreliable. But the other thing is like, I eventually got annoyed driving it around because everywhere you go- The flux capacitors are dog shit as well. Yeah, I heard. they don't work for crap. <laughs> but no, you go around and like the whole time there's like 45 year old <laughs> nerds like who want to just talk to you about the car. Like I was like, dude, I, I don't want to talk to you about the car. I want to go get a, I'm just here to get some baby formula. Like let's not talk about the car. So you couldn't take it anywhere, which is the, which is the problem if you're an invert. I guess you're an extrovert you thought it was great but like it was a middle-aged nerd attractor everywhere i went anyway so back to back to the regularly scheduled oh, sure. program and, and all male as oh, well no, <laughs> no women are like hey i want to talk to that guy he's got a delorean like a zero sweet delorean <laughs> no <laughs> nobody cares so no, i i the also have a funny story i have a funny story about dominating niche as well so my wife used to work for a large multi-billion dollar uh, filter manufacturer. And they ran SAP. Uh, they had an on-premise installation of SAP, which is a, an ERP you know, business software system. And it hadn't been, like many on-premise ERP software systems had not been touched in like 30 years, right? Um, and, and each administration essentially kicks the can down the road, right? Oh, the next guy will deal with it, the next CTO will deal with it, whatever, right? Um, and it got to the point where like one of the drives broke and their ERP went down. And it was just, it was not work. Like it stopped the whole company. Like it was just over. They couldn't kick the can anymore. Like it was done. Uh, they paid like $100,000 for a used, because they're not making new ones anymore, like from some guy like on eBay, who was the, the guy of these old custom SAP drives or whatever that like vacuums them up in estate sales or whatever. And he was like, yeah, that'd be a hundred grand. This drive was like a hundred dollars, you know, like <laughs> new. And he sold it to him for a hundred grand and air freighted it to him because they needed it. And he was the only one that had it. Mo good margins in that case. It's, it's good. It's good to corner a market. That's what I have to say. All right. So anyway, back to our deal. So I think we've determined this is some, some sort of specialty kind of situation. This is a special situations kind of printing low run just in time, very highly customized. That's the other thing they have here, which is really interesting, is they say that, um, where was it? Attention to detail, exceptional product. Anyway, just a lot of like creative. Oh, here's the company's creative and knowledgeable sales team works directly with customers in diverse markets to develop solutions for custom packaging requirements. So to me, that smells like exactly what we're talking about. And you got three salespeople for $5 million in sales. Yeah, it's probably it's probably custom. But that being said, it seems to work. They got 92% repeat business. I mean, you look at like, uh, we've talked about subscale manufacturers before. Like, this is a pretty good little business. Like, like definitely packaging and this sort of stuff isn't going anywhere. Like, they're very diversified in terms of their customer base. Like, they have this exclusive ability to sell Tyvek stuff. Like, there's some like interesting assets here, right? Um, you're you have 20 manufacturing people in the Northeast. Like, good luck like replacing those if you want to go and compete with these guys. Uh, you probably have some equipment, and I guess that's where you know Red Zeller would come in and tell us like, okay, well, you got to see what kind of equipment you're dealing with here because the the D the, of depreciation in your EBITDA may be killing you in terms of what these people are having to spend. And it is interesting here, and you can tell it's a manufacturing business because they quote. Uh, pro they quote profits not in owner free cash flow. They quote it EBITDA. So I'm very curious what the actual D is in this whole thing in terms of depreciation. Sometimes you see these businesses though, and like it's the same machines that they've been running on for 20 years, and they're fully depreciated. You know, and 
on one hand, that's good. It means they're not needing to be replaced every five years. On the other hand, eventually they're going to die and you might not want to be holding the bag because sometimes you can't even replace them. Like, you know, maybe they don't make these machines anymore and that's their niche. And that's why there's no competitors. I like that this business is packaging and not printing. You know, it's, I think, less commoditized than than printing. Like, you know, there's tons of screen printers and people who print vehicle wraps. And then, you know, it, those businesses are just, I think, more kind of, it's more of a commoditized service. Whereas with packaging, you know, they're doing something that they could easily also print. You know, if they're, you know, printing sleeves for hotel, you know, room keys, cards, if they're making the sleeves, which really you're just talking about taking, you know, a piece of paper, cutting it, folding it, maybe gluing parts of it together, you could easily add printing to the mix and it wouldn't be that hard to go that direction. The printers, though, it's harder for them to move up market because they're used to receiving, you know, the fabricated thing, whether it's paper or an envelope or a binder or whatever and printing on it. So I like that they're kind of slightly higher up the the food chain in terms of what they have to actually uh, touch and produce and, and the byproduct. The issue I have with it, it does pencil, okay? But in 2020, they were hardly making any money. And in 2019, they were making even less. So this jump in EBITDA is really nice. And I think it's obviously kind of convenient. Now's the time they want to sell. If you have a million dollars in EBITDA, and let's just say that you know it, everything's fully depreciated and there's not a lot of there's a lot of you know earnings, there's not a lot of DA in this case. You could finance this business. It's probably going to cost about four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a year in debt service, but there's some margin of safety if the earnings can continue <laughs> at this level. But I would not bank on you know, rapid growth. And I would really, really want to figure out historically, what has this business done when they shed customers? Because they are diversified now, but how long is that sales cycle? You got to think the people who make, you know, paper card sleeves and, you know, envelope packaging, like those are really hard relationships to disrupt. I would think that picking up new customers is much, much more difficult. Um, and it's a, it's a long sales cycle. I have a question for you guys, because this says that they are a government GSA contract holder selling to the U.S. government, and some of the 46% of their revenue, government and financial services, is clearly dependent on that GSA contract. I'm going to assume for a second this is trans- this is transferable. Um, assuming it is transferable, is this a weapon? Like, Can you sell, like, once you have a GSA, can you sell anything to the government, or can you only sell paper card sleeves to the government? Like, can you use this to go bid on other stuff that you might be able to, like, is this the growth lever for this business? No, I don't think so. I mean, it, let's just assume it is transferable in when I, when I read that though, I immediately think it's gotta be a stock sale. It has to be a stock purchase for those credentials to usually transfer. Uh, Because if you all of a sudden have a new EIN number, the government's going to be like, who are you? You know, we don't care. We don't care that you have the same name and you have the same customers and you're selling us the same stuff and the same employees. Doesn't matter. Different EIN number. Um, it's not in a way. It's 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 worth something. But if you know how to bid to the federal government, that's really where the value is. Because if you know how to bid to the federal government, these are all you know. There's very very complicated contract mechanisms for the United States government, but they are all public. It's all accessible information and you can bid it if you know how to access the information and if you know how to actually be a qualified bidder to GSA. So I I would say it's worth something, but it's not like a silver bullet. Is it combined though? They seem to have some sort of contract with Tyvek, which is a specific thing, right? With DuPont is the combination of the fact that they can source and manipulate Tyvek which I imagine has myriad uses throughout the government with the GSA contract. I I wonder if putting those two together, the exclusive access to Tyvek and the GSA contract and the know-how on bidding on these things, then you just go, where does the government need to use Tyvek? I'm bidding on all those things. I'm going to win some of them. I think though what they're saying is they have exclusive distributorship with Tyvek for like envelopes or or something that that they specify. I can't imagine that DuPont's like, hey, you know what? 
you're, you know, you have unlimited license and also you and two people are the only ones who have unlimited license. I think it's super specific to maybe a Tyvek envelope or a Tyvek, you know, Whatever. card holder or something like that. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think that, you know, you just can take that and run with it. I mean, Tyvek's used in a ton of things, right? It's house wrap. It's, you know, it's a waterproofing and a vapor barrier and all those things. But um, that's why it makes for a good card holder because it won't like melt if it gets wet like paper. I mean, at the same time, like you have heard these stories, right? Of these like small businesses that get bought and the guy who buys it realizes that it's just a conduit and they pump like everything through the conduit. You know, they're like, oh, we can sell. We may not be exclusive, but we know how to buy Tyvek. We know how to get it from DuPont. DuPont will sell it to us, you know, even if we're not exclusive. So like government uses a crap load of Tyvek. I'm going to bid on all of it and win 5% of it. And here we go. You know, and then they win some huge contract. And 20 years later, they're lining the inside of all the Humvees with Tyvek. And you're like, this started as a cardholder business. <laughs> you know, It depends on the nature of the contract, too. The best government contracts are what's called IDIQ indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. And it just says, hey, for this period of time, when we need this thing, you are one of a few people that we call. It's not a fixed price to say, hey, look, we will spend up to a million dollars with you in the next three years, or we won't or, or we won't spend any money, but there's a cap or a ceiling in place. IDIQ is the best because it's just, at, you know, it, within the defined contract period, which might be three, five, or seven years typically in the government world, you know, whenever we need this stuff, you're on the list and there's only a few people we can actually buy it from. And there's no financial cap. There's no ceiling in place. Those are the real good, you know, those are the ones that are actually worth something because then, you know, there's some predictability, like the government is going to need fill in the blank. And we are one of a few people who could actually sell it to them. And those are the types of things that you can ram, you know, the an entire economy through the garden hose, like into the government. In, in some cases, but not always, because in some cases it's so limited, right? Of, you know, let's just say it's something like, you know, computer chairs or something like that. There's pretty good historical data to say the federal government is going to buy X number of computer chairs a year. The contracts are written in such a way that just because you're selling them computer chairs doesn't mean you can sell them computers. That's a different, that's a different, you know, um, like, JSOC task order, right? And the way that the government puts it out, it's a whole different um, kind of code and line item that they procure under. And these procurement, I mean, we deal with it a little bit in the roofing business, just when we do roofing work for the federal government, but the guys who know this stuff are so nerdy in the best way. It is just attention to detail and death by pushing paper. Which is what you have to do in order to do business with the government. You have to be great at pushing paper and dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and not foot folding and waiting two years to win the contract. And then you're in. But there's like, there's, it's all public. You can go to like beta. I think it's beta.sam or betasam.gov. It, it recently migrated. But you can just go and look like what are the open government contracts and what can you bid on? The benefit in a lot of cases is, you know, the, if you have the contract, it's worth something for a certain amount of time, but it's not open-ended. It's not like you have unique distribution or unique product or you need a unique intellectual property necessarily. But these things get bid on, you know, on schedule and on a, on a regular and reoccurring basis, but it's public information and you can just go out there and see what, what's available, you know, at, you know, Fort Jackson or Fort Gordon or, you know, the FBI or whatever. And you can search in different ways like that. Interesting. So we like this one. I think yeah. it's intriguing. Uh, so where do we think it would trade for? Like wh how much would it sell for? What do you think, Mills? I mean, I think it, the math works at four times, assuming that the EBITDA is actual, you know, is actually real, that there's some earnings there. Um, I also, you know, am assuming it's not super owner centric. If the owner is one of the salespeople, like they're not really on the org chart, but if the owner does 80% of the sales, that nukes the valuation. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really difficult. I have a friend who just recently bought a business and his lead sales guy lives on a boat. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this could be the world's worst, you know, situation that you're stepping into. Like he has a cell phone, his phone rings. It's a very, very specific service. But he's like, this guy's so happy. He's on a salary. He has the most flexible, you know, situation. He just lives on a boat and his phone rings and he sells our product. You just never know, right? Where are like those nexus points of risk? And it seems like 
the sales aspect of this is a big one because they've opened up some doors that you may have just a rainmaker in there. And I hope it's not the owner. Or if it is the owner, I hope there's some way to transfer some of that. It is interesting how small the office and accounting team is, which leads me to believe the owner is probably doing more than we think or more than they let on. So I would definitely do that. Right. <laughs> Always the case. <laughs> yeah. That's, Always. that's for dang sure. Uh, this is SBA eligible. There's probably some fixed assets. They don't talk about any real estate here as far as I saw. So you're probably looking at a leased premises, but like definitely in the size of what you could do an SBA loan if you're a first-time borrower. Uh, you know, some of our, our former sponsors, like uh, former and current sponsors like Pioneer Capital Advisory, I uh, would say you could probably structure it with little money down if you did a seller note on full standby. So those all seem like... Uh, Seem like things that make this attractive for you know your typical searcher type that wants to live somewhere in the Northeast. I guess we we decided that's where this is. It says, mm-hmm. "Yep, I think this is definitely a case where you advocate for like a three year average EBITDA. You know, not a last twelve months, just because of you know the earnings have you know gone up ten x in the last three years. Yep, million percent. Bill, any closing thoughts? Otherwise, I think we can uh, put a pin in this one and call it a good episode. I like it. Let's it call it that. That was that was fun one. Good stories in this one. <laughs> uh, if you, I hope somebody gets the NDA on this. Yeah, if you like, not us. I hope a listener gets the NDA and tells us some cool story about it because I feel like there's <laughs> something to this. Oh, I here's what I bet happens. Somebody gets the NDA and then I get a DM that they're like, "Girdley, that publish that envelope thing. It's X-rated envelopes. That's what it is. <laughs> like, there's no, it's it's all X-rated envelopes." They saw that's that's what I believe it is. So super cool. All right. Well, hey, uh, do us a favor if you made it this far. Uh, leave us a review. Hopefully, it rhymes with five stars, and uh, we would uh, really appreciate it. it. Helps us with getting the word out about what we're doing, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. See y'all next week. <laughs>